Thank you so much, Simon, okay. for uh, joining us this very last minute. And um, the student just watched your wonderful film. This is so touching. And um, I mean, it's just, um, I mean, you bring so much to the life of the children and, and you able to enter into their space is so wonderful. Um, and uh, it's, it's brings hope as well as sadness. And I want to congratulate you on, on the film. So you. Yuli, yeah. uh, here. <laughs> yeah, that's my, yeah. I'm, I'm a, a co-teacher here. Uh, I'm teaching yeah. with Ruby here. And this is um, GMSC, Department of Journalism. But we have a, a production class here. At the end of the class, they have to make a short documentary. So five to seven mm -hmm. projects every year. So yeah, we had a selection of films uh, every every Monday. So a feature length film. So then we are discussing the storytelling structure. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, OK, should we start? Is there some here? Can you give an uh, impression for the director? from our class so <laughs> that's just <the> <laughs> <for students>. wow great <laughs> yeah master students mainland um, uh, mainly from uh mainland yeah so yeah okay a lot of talent yes well hopefully they they can make a film like your film um so touching um my first question will be um you know, to enter this, their space, I mean, the cameras almost feel invisible. Yeah. And and it's, how do you build trust and um, into their space? And, and how long does it take to get their, you know, approval to, to enter into a very private space? That's a great question. It's it's also a very nuanced answer. I think it has some components in it. I think first of all, me doing my own cinematography and my own sound, you know, basically just being me filming. Uh, I think that has a, a lot to do with it because uh, it's a little bit easier uh, to get to know people if you don't have a whole crew with lights or anything. So. I quit more quickly because it's just me. I arrive at a place where it's just, oh, it's Simon and the camera, you know? Um, and then I spend a lot of time uh, hanging out with, with my subjects uh, because I'm interested in their lives. And the more that I know about their lives and their hopes and their dreams and their fears, the more I can become wise to how their world works and when you know, certain interesting situations might arise. So with, with, with adults, it's about, you know, them really getting to know me. But with kids, it's actually, first of all, to build that mutual trust. And I think, you know, it's also about being uh, very honest and very true to who I am but also to respect their boundaries. So I do a, a lot about telling them not to, or, or if there's something that they don't want me to film, do you know, just put up your hand or walk away. And in those incidents where that happens, because that does happen, it's so important that I, I, I honor my word and I actually, you know, stop filming. That creates or goes a long way to creating, you know, um, some kind of mutual trust that they know that I won't, overstep their boundaries. So I would actually say, sorry for the long answer, but I would actually say the hardest part is actually for them to stop wanting to, to, to hang out with me, so to speak. Uh, and what I do is I always say, okay, for the next hour, uh, I always give it like a timeline, I'm a ghost. And then I know, you know, that they always tease me in the beginning, trying to provoke me talking into the microphone or looking straight into the camera. But, but if I stop, you know, reacting to that and just pretend like nothing, at some point I become boring. And that's when they turn to each other and say, okay, what should we do? And then it's their own will doing what they want to do. And when you have kids that wants to do something, they're, they're much more focused on that task instead of, of me, you know, running around with a camera. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, so you're coming from Denmark. So uh, Ukraine is far away. So uh, do you remember uh, um, how came the story to you? Um, this new film is actually because uh, of my previous film, which was ah. also shot in Ukraine. Ah. Um, that film is about a young kid uh, who lives alone with his grandmother at the very front line of the then war in Ukraine. Um, and I got very close to this strange but very lovable couple. Um, and since she's the only one or was the only one taking care of the young boy, at some point in the later stages of the shooting of that film, she got very ill uh, with heart disease. And that really made me worry what would actually happen to the young ah. boy if she were to pass away. And, and I wanted to be prepared to help ah. in some kind of way if, if that were to happen. Uh, so that's why I initially, initially, initially asked my look, yeah. uh, Ukrainian uh, assistant director, I said, to, can you research it just so yeah. that we're prepared, you know? But luckily, ah. you know, she survived and everything is going great. But he came back really quickly saying, listen, Simon, you've actually touched upon a problem here because ah. there are a lot of kids who are left without grown-ups okay. actually having uh, uh, the possibility to take care of them. Uh, and, and not only this, up in the northern parts of the front line, the city administration has seen your previous film and they actually would love to, to, to show you around and to give you a more in-depth uh, impression of what actually happens to kids in this situation and that's how I ended up in Lysychansk as a kind of like a long story but <laughs> no that's yeah. inter no that's interesting that there uh, was something before so and in this um <laughs> ah interesting yeah that that's int uh, that's good yeah but why Ukraine so for the first project yeah that was that was actually be because the first two films I made were short documentaries for kids, featuring kids also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I was done with those two films that I had been contracted for, I looked at them and it occurred to me that they are they're both films about uh, kids that have very safe lives and th that life is not temporarily out of balance and then they regain that balance. Um, and then it kind of dawned on me that there's so many kids at that point in time that were living in the exact opposite world, you know, in conflicts where their life was, uh, you know, fraught with, with um, uncertainty and maybe even physical danger at some point. And I got very interested in finding out where do you go as a child in that very impressionable and very fragile stage of your life, yeah. adolescence and, and the early teens, where do you go uh, to, to kind of seek that comfort uh, or that sense of security that I feel you need to grow up without too many scars on on uh, on your soul. Um, and to be honest, I didn't dare go to the Middle East. And that's, I was looking around what kind of alternatives are there for conflict zones. And, you know, I almost got surprised that there was a war going on in Ukraine because there was yeah. not much uh, at that point in time in the Danish uh, news uh, image about uh, Ukraine at all, even though it's just on the borders of Ukraine or of Europe. So immediately I got very fascinated and as luck would have it, I found that really capable fixer and that's how I ended up in, uh, in Ukraine. Wonderful. I understand you spent two years at the, um, uh, the, the place and yeah. did you um film several kids that not ending up not in the film because yeah. you know during the two years many child many children come and go right and yeah. so when did the point that you came upon Sasha uh, uh and then the um other boy this wonderful character I I think it uh the final choosing so to speak was was in the in the editing and it had a very pragmatic uh, practical reason uh, and a little bit hard one also of what we discovered my editor and I was that uh, originally I'd filmed five kids actually um, but but what we discovered was that 
uh, if we included the stories of all five kids, mathematically, that would reduce every kid's story yeah. to a certain uh, amount of minutes. And those minutes were simply not enough for us as an audience to feel any other than voyeurs. Yeah. Uh, but we discovered that when we took out two stories, all of a sudden we like reached almost a magical amount of minutes spending with each kid in the film, which allowed us to uh, identify and really start to develop emotions uh, on behalf of, uh, of our main characters. And the last thing that I would want to do uh, in the film like this was to be voyeuristic. So it was a very hard decision to take out two stories, but it was simply, we had to do it. There was no other way around it. That's wonderful. I think we should open the Q&A to a uh, student. Anyone who have questions, please come forward. It usually takes one brave soul to start. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Simon. Hello. Um, um, thank you very much. A very, very enjoyable film. First question is, uh, I just heard you, you spent two years filming. Is that correct? Uh, yes, but but I should maybe elaborate that the, the way I do it, because I have a family also, is that I go every second month for 10 to 14 days. All right. So it's like trips <clears throat> over the course of roughly two years. Every second month, I go for a week, two weeks. And uh -huh. for that 10 to 14 days, did you stay, did you live in the home mm -hmm. yourself? No, uh, I found uh, I, I, I really early on, I started to develop a, a close personal uh, uh, and professional um, collaboration with the caregivers. And for me, that was one of the things that I wanted to find out. Is it necessary or is it good for me to stay at the at the shelter? Also, because it takes a lot of work for me to always be, you know, on, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But after a long conversation with Margarita and Olga, it was also, I think that it's good for the kids that, that you're not there all the time, that, that you're actually there as a treat instead of, as something you know that becomes ordinary and i think they were so right in that an analysis because what did happen was that that we were kind of like aliens me and my assistant director we were kind of like aliens visiting and it was a very pleasant very enjoyable like break in their everyday routine and something they could mm. distract themselves with for a lot mm. of the time and i think Margarita and Olga, you know, understanding this and giving me that advice was really, really amazing. One last question and uh, maybe slightly sensitive. Would oh, you no. ever consider in the future, maybe 10 years time to follow up ah, and find out where a, and how these kids are? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, actually, just when the film was finished, I had a hard time. Uh, um, I had a time hard time ending this film because I think I could have gone on for <laughs> years and years, you know, <laughs> following exactly Kolya and Sasha and Alina. Uh, you know, um, I definitely would consider in ten years' time to see uh, what has become of them. But but luckily, you know, since both me and my whole crew got so close to these kids, it's it was also impossible for us just to say goodbye so we yeah. also wanted to do something for the kids so what we did mm -hmm. was actually to, to make a kind of a pilot project uh, where we hired two psychologists with children's trauma to be available for the kids if they wanted to talk uh, and that program it was for all the kids in the that was in the shelter while we were there and we had such good results um, unfortunately, the war kind of like threw in a lot of gravel into that machinery, but we're kind of establishing it, it again now. But but um, that also meant that we have a really good idea of where they are and how mm. they're doing. And uh, uh, yeah, Kolya just uh, got, um, um, what do you call it, adopted uh, one and a half months ago. 
uh, and it's a seemingly really resourceful and good family. And they, they, you know, promised me that they will do everything that they within their power to, for him to to uh, to reconnect in some way with his siblings because they all went to a different family, all of wow. them, but they didn't take Kolya. So Kolya ended up first in the orphanage and then, you know, war and orphanage in Europe. And but finally, you know, some good, good news, you know. Mm, it could run for some time. Yeah. Very, very good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, how, how was the premiere? So all the kids are in, uh, were invited, right? Um, yes. At that point in time, the war, the new war, so to speak, hadn't. Uh, it was in May 2021. Uh, we went down, we were finished editing and we went down to uh, Lysychansk to screen ah. the film for the kids, the caregivers and the political system uh -huh. before anybody else saw the film. Um, uh, so we arranged one day where we gathered in the kids from all over, you know, and they hadn't seen each other, some of them for six yeah. months. And it was a beautiful day. And we had the psychologist there because we kind of anticipated, yeah. you know, that this is going to be a difficult uh, thing for them. But in the beginning, the screening, it was very beautiful. And they were, you know, screaming and laughing and making fun of each other. But as the film grew on, obviously, you know, it touches upon very delicate moments, sensitive moments in their lives. But it afterwards, uh, it became a, a really good uh, way for the kids to, with the psychologist as kind of like a medium to start to share uh, and open okay. up about their mutual, because all of them has the same, uh, uh, roughly the same uh, feelings and the same uh, histories of betrayal and let, being let down and stuff. So it was actually a very beautiful way to, to begin that conversation with the psychologists. And I think it, it was a really amazing day, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next day we screened it for the political uh, uh, people and the caregivers because it was very important for me that they also, you know, Agreed. said, I, mm. I want I want your blessings that this is like an accurate portrayal of your life and your work. And luckily, they were also very uh, uh, extremely happy about the film. So, yeah. That's great. Congratulations. So next question. Hi, hello. Thank you very much for all the amazing film. So I've got a question about the consent, the permission you've get. Um, yeah. uh, it's actually, uh, I'm confused, like, because those children, those kids, they were living with, uh, apart from their parents. And uh, yeah. it seems that their parents are like, not in the state of uh, care so much about their children, not to mention that a documentary film. Uh, so did you get the permission only from the caregivers uh, from the shelter or how, how, what's the permission you've got? Well, it's a little bit different from, from each child's case because, because obviously some of the children had already been abandoned. And in those cases, it would be either from the state or from uh, uh, what do you call it, the foster families who would later adopt them. So actually, it's kind of like a big job. And it's always kind of like a, a puzzle. For some of the kids, we would need three different uh, permissions, for example, first from the parents, then as they lost custody, we would need from the from the administration. And then if they were adopted, we would need from their foster uh, parents at all. So it was uh, like a huge job collecting all of these uh, permissions, but we have permissions, obviously, of course, for, for, for every one of the kids that were in the shelter uh, at the time that we were there. But it, it touches upon a really, a, a really good question also about the, the ethical questions about whether or not to, to film these kids. And, and obviously, in the end, I made the film, so I'm the one responsible, so to speak. Um, I think First of all, I didn't, I didn't feel in any way at any point that these kids, the one that I chose to portray, uh, uh, was opposed to it. Rather the opposite, that they were actually really happy to be part of the project. Um, also, what, what I learned was that, that this is like a growing problem 
uh, 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 for each kid, Margarita told me that they take into this shelter, they could have easily taken 10 more. And it wasn't like this just a few years ago. So it was like a problem that was spiraling out of control. So obviously the kids are maybe not able to grasp the full spectrum of what does it mean to be in a film in this point in your life? And how do you feel about it in 30 years? But, but in reality and in the end, I hope that they will come to me if it, if, if it becomes you know, a problem. Um, I accept that responsibility, of course. But for me, it was so important, along with the caregivers, that somebody actually told the story of these kids because they were just yeah. invisible and nothing was being done. And now at least things seems people in the political establishment and also in the world for that example is starting to listen and is yeah. starting to actually uh, uh, do something about this problem so uh, you're right that it's a balance of sorts yeah. thank you thank you very much it's very inspiring and meaningful thank you thank you that's um uh shooting with children under age is very delicate um the process the ethical questions and how do you really show their uh, emotional feeling without hurting them i think you're yeah. handling it beautifully in this film and and also you know you there's things that you don't need to say with the relationship of the shasha and the alina i mean the beautiful yeah. friendship and yeah. i especially like the scene when in the crystal ball and that was yeah. like amazing so how did yeah. you invite being invited to the being in part of the yeah. <laughs> crystal ball <laughs> but but it, it's the same as with the boys you know having you know telling those ghost stories it's because i really it were interested in their lives and then you know at some point the, uh, i was talking to some of the girls and i was saying it was such a, an amazing scene that i filmed with the boys uh, because they were telling each other ghost stories and girls were like, what? No, no, you should come to one of our fortune telling events, you know? <laughs> so it, it's, it's all about being open and being curious and being interested. And I can tell you that all of the girls that I spend the whole day just recording fortune after fortune after fortune. <laughs> but I, obviously really? in the film, it's only Alina and Sasha that ends up being, uh, being you know, having a scene of it. But actually, also Kolya was also in the in the fortune, and he turned it around completely. It was a beautiful scene. It's sad that it didn't end up in the film, but he's kind of like really, uh, you know, the girl that was doing the fortune. She was a little bit in love with Kolya, and and he knew Whoa. it, so he was like acting up to her. And then when she kind of like got a little bit embarrassed, he started to tell her fortune, and maybe it had something to do with him. Maybe it didn't. And, <laughs> You know, so there's a lot of really good stuff there, but it's obviously things might not end up in the film, but it, it's about being interested and being curious. Yeah. Yes, that's great. Any more questions? Can you give us an idea? So the market of documentaries is overcrowded with good films. Your film is yeah. a good film. How can you give us an idea? Yeah, because to make a good film is one side, but to gain attention, yeah, like people from Sunday. And so they have a lot of submissions. How did you get uh, this kind of att attention for your project? Where there's somebody mm. uh, from Cinefield involved from the early beginning or where a founding yeah, from Sundance or something like this? Or yes. did you make a lot of pitchings? Can you give us a little bit yeah. uh, from the production side, preparation, yeah. um, so all these things, what it needs to the uh, in nowadays. <laughs> yeah, no, that's kind of like maybe the the sad and a little bit uh, boring part, unfair part of uh, making films like this. Because you're absolutely right, the commercial um, interest is so fickle and it's so difficult to get, um, especially in the states. I would say. I think Europe is a little bit more open, but but it it begins already when you're when you're making your film. Uh, uh -huh. You pitch you pitch your film and you pitch it at places where you know 
there's a good history of important people watching, you yeah. know, the pitches. For example, ITFA or Nordic Panorama or Doc Barcelona or, yeah. or film festivals like this that also have a pitching process. Yeah. And it's not only to get the attention of the commissioning editors, it's also to get the attention of potential really powerful sales uh, people or maybe even the American, uh, you know, streaming services. And it's not, you know, even... Of course, you want money to make your film, but 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 there's also the currency of of attention, you know, yes. that they're interested and they they're actually considering your film if it lives up to the standards when it's done, then they might actually be interested. In. So it's like planting a, a seeds all over, and then when the film is done, if it's a good film, uh, they will probably go back to you and say, okay, okay. let's talk uh, business, and. Uh, the sad part is the greater, the, the, the more powerful your backers are, the more chance you have of actually making it. But I will also uh, put a little light in the darkness and say we had powerful backers, but we didn't come and we didn't gain any traction in the States, for example, with this film. And contrary to the other films that we've been nominated with, you know, we have no marketing project. <laughs> That's why people were writing articles, you know, who is that last film? What's it doing there? It's not being screened by anybody. It's not being broadcasted. We can't see it anywhere. What, the, <laughs> what is this film, you know? And, and, and then, you know, it had been nominated, I think, mostly because the European uh, and the rest of the world had seen it and really said, okay, this is beautiful craftsmanship. It's an important story. The Americans has to see this, you know? And 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 that's why it actually succeeded in getting nominated. Yeah. So so it can be done if you make a film beautiful enough or good enough. I can I can definitely recommend a different film uh, uh, that has been traveling the awards festival cir circuit with me. That's called Children of the Mist. Yeah. Um, I think it takes place in Thailand. It's a beautiful, beautiful film by a young, yeah. really talented. She was invited in, in our first class. She yeah. was. Uh, okay. She spoke to us. It's a beautiful film. Yeah. And, yeah. and and, she, and she could, yes, she could definitely be up here in this competition as well. Yeah. But I think it, we at least had some knowledge uh, with my previous film that also got shortlisted about ah. the whole system, how it works. So we were a little bit prepared. Ah. And I think that, to be honest, I think the only thing, the only reason why Children of the Mist didn't make it to the nominations is because the, it's still too new. The whole Oscar thing is still too new of a process because there's so many hidden rules and unsaid yeah. uh, truth that you need to know. Uh, but it can be done. So it's all about concentrating on the film and and letting some other really clever yeah. marketing people or yeah, yeah figure it out but i think you have a, a lot of to do in this kind of observational style you have a lot of footage you have to sit in the editing room you have to organize your your footage and to find a storytelling structure can you give us uh, yeah. some uh, impression of um how long was the editing time so yeah. was it uh, a lot of different choices so uh, because in the beginning we have 15 minutes the the one story of the little girl is so touching i was crying after five minutes so yeah. and then when she left in a grandpa uh, uh, grandma home uh, then it is a kind of oh what happened ne next yeah? yeah so i was thinking about oh god that's a very sensitive moment yeah uh, for, yeah. Uh, for the storytelling yeah. structure how did yeah. you manage it? But it's terrible. And you're <laughs> it, it, <laughs> the thing is that that we were looking through the material, my brilliant editor, Michael Olon, and I, and we I knew that it was very powerful material, but uh, no matter how much we struggle with it, we couldn't kind of make it fit into this American, you know, traditional storytelling way. Um so and and honestly, I lean on that model a lot, but 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 in this, I just had to accept, I think in the end that it's not going to happen. So, oh. so, so what do you do then? And then Michael said, you know, Simon, what about just being true to, to how things unfolded? What about just being chronological? Because there is an inherent, 
kind of like an inherent framework in that child comes in, nine months go by, an answer comes, and then, you know, that's how the story is, you know. So what about just being true to, to, to how you filmed it? And that's what we did in the end, ah. chronologically. And so we haven't switched around any scenes, so to speak, um, at least none that I can recall at all. Um, it is just, but 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 what we then did because you're right, there are that moment where it kind of like you're tipping because you don't know where you're going. Um, but we just have to accept that. Also, there wasn't so much material with Eva as yeah. we had with the others because we didn't yeah. follow him from the very moment yeah, of yeah, being, yeah. coming in. So her story, uh, it, it's kind of like life almost presented it in a good way because she's kind of like opening up the universe with her, yeah. her story. And that's yeah. her function, so to speak. Yeah. But also it's nice that it's a it's a story that ends up yeah. well yeah. because yeah. that kind of prepares us for what happens yeah. with the next two kids. Yeah. So and in a lot of ways, we've also been very lucky, yeah. uh, straight up luck, that the kids' stories kind of like filled out the three ways of leaving Margarita's place, mm. either with your parent or relative, with a foster family or to the orphanage. And yeah. that's not by design. That's just how it happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a lot of luck also, but but we focused a lot of each child individual story. And we were also, you know, experimenting a lot about how much to mingle uh, Sasha and uh, Kolya's story. Um, but in the end, it's all about those minutes that you spend again with, with, with each kid so that you don't lose, you know, your connection yeah. to them. Yeah. If you feel familiar with somebody, you don't want to leave her exactly. or him. Yeah. So, exactly. but it's it's a clever decision uh, to set up an emotional level in the beginning with the with her. Yeah. Because then everybody is expecting in the rest of the film. So, okay, from the emotional level, the filmmaker is able to cover this kind of emotions and also eye level of the camera. So. You have an impression everything is in the first 15 minutes established. And so with another guy or another uh, character, it can happen again. Yeah. So that is, I think yeah. that is the clever way uh, yeah. to create expectations or to uh, follow up your story. Yeah. But it's, yeah. oh, I can't imagine uh, uh, how you were struggling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took six, six months. We had six months to edit the film. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, for documentary. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, yes. it's really good. <laughs> so, what? Just tell us about your uh, equipment and sound. So, you is everything you did yourself. So, even with the sound, right? Yes. What kind of equipment did you use? Uh, it's shot on a Canon C three hundred Mark II. Oh. Uh, it's not that big of a camera actually, but it's a bit heavy. Uh, especially because I don't have any rigs or anything, so everything is handheld. Um, and then I use kind of like the standard, the best uh, objective ever is the 24 70 millimeter uh, objective. Uh, okay, the zoom lens with 2.8. Mm. Yes, exactly. That's like the best lens for doing ah, documentary. Really? Ah. Yeah, at least I think so because it's versatile. Uh, obviously, you can you can shoot on prime also, but that kind of narrows your your possibilities and a little bit of zoom in some situations can save an Im an image yes. in a way you know, yes. that's really important. Um, so obviously, uh, that's the basic setup. Sound wise, uh, I would place a shotgun mic uh, on the camera, uh, okay. and then I would choose one kit. Uh, per day, who would actually be bearing the the lavalier? Ah, uh, exactly. Um, yeah, just one lavalier. But I might add that my sound people said to me, Simon, this is your second film we've done it with you, and if you don't get sound training for the next one, we will not <laughs> work with you again. <laughs> so they've done such an amazing job of uh, of uh, of cleaning up the sound. And <laughs> And, and working that. with it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but you have to understand if there's a sound man, you cannot get those intimate moments with no. the kids. No, 
exactly were, yeah no okay well anyway that's really um helpful so did you ever present okay. your two kids to the kids a picture of no. your yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I think that's also. Yeah, yeah, that was also something that we were very, I was talking so much with Margarita and Olga about in yeah. that point in time, because, you know, all of them obviously had an, I, a, a dream that I would adopt them and stuff. And it's <laughs> very important to be very early on to be straight up and say, listen, yeah. guys, that you are also a father. Anything, but that's, yeah. that's not, I have a family already. And yes. that's part of, of yeah. Yeah. Yes. Another okay. Student. Another question. Actually, there's a quite a burden because you're a filmmaker as well as parents to them. Yeah. 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 Yes. So I had a question. Like, uh, so the whole action uh, uh, happened in uh, Lysychansk, right? Yes. Um, which is now uh, occupied by Russia. Uh, so uh, do you have uh, any news of uh, what happened with the? orphanage like uh, since it was uh, heavily i think uh, supported by the ukrainian government uh, yeah. so how did it happen with the russian takeover um yeah it's a really good question uh, luckily we know some but in war the truth is always the first thing to go just to keep that in mind i haven't been there to see it for myself but but Lysychansk, as you point out is actually one of the most contested cities of the front line of this recent war it's seen a, a really hardcore fighting. Uh, a lot of the city has been leveled, so it's not there anymore. Margarita's shelter is part of an hospital, um, which uh, of course it would be a good place to bomb, but maybe also is it wise? Because if we can take this, then we have the, 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 a fully functional hospital also. So uh, what, what, what Margarita and Olga told me uh, in October last year, when I met them last, uh, was that they heard from some of their friends that are still in the neighborhood that a Russian missile uh, hit actually the shelter and it went down through the roof of the of the uh, main uh, hall, so to speak. But it didn't explode. So actually, right now there's just a missile standing down through the 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 structure uh, but 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 again i don't know if it's true or not but i do know that most of lisichansk is gone okay in the fighting and uh, also i believe like maybe uh, maybe you don't know but uh, since it's right at the front line uh, maybe there would be like uh, some families that are uh, separated uh, like physically because maybe some parents they still stay in a ukrainian controlled region and uh, the the shelter, uh, I don't know where it's it located, maybe in the Russian or Ukrainian part, like, uh, I don't know if you have some, uh, some, uh, some stories about it. I do. I have a lot of stories about that. Uh, early on the morning of the 4th of February already, you know, in the dawn of the war, uh, Olga was put on a train along with all the kids in the, in the shelter at that point in time, and they were driven westwards. Oh, it was a train train trip that took i think somewhere between two and three days because they had to stop a lot of times because of shelling uh at near the trains um but they got out they went to uh to lviv in the first place in the western parts of ukraine uh but when that was also bombed a few times uh, they were actually evacuated into europe where a lot of the kids are actually in the temporary orphanage at the moment oh, really? uh sasha one of them, for example, uh, her foster mom that you saw in the film, she got cold feet and she uh, she uh, canceled the, the uh, foster parent agreement. So Sasha was actually sent to this orphanage along with Kolya. And those two kids were among the, the kids placed on the train. And uh, until the war happened, Kolya was actually allowed to talk to his siblings because they had been adopted all of them all four of them had been adopted by one family and oh. contrary to what you do normally you sever like family connections they actually allowed him to keep in contact oh. with his siblings and they lived very close to the orphanage so he could actually go see them but since the war happened you know uh, he completely lost contact because he was transported all the way to europe in the end um, and that's why his new foster parents are now trying all that they can do to try and local, localize this family. Are they still 
uh, you know, behind enemy lines now, or did they also flee to another part of Ukraine? And if they did, you know, where in Ukraine did they go to and can we establish contact? So that's a very direct uh, um, uh, result of, of this recent war, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. I mean, th this is so uh, informative in terms of, you know, about the children and the fake and the war. And um, yeah. I, uh, again, thank you so much for sharing your, yeah. you know, sharing with us and with our students. Well, Good luck with the film. It was a pleasure. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Have a great day in, uh, in Hong Kong. Fingers are keeping crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Help spread the word if you like yes. it. Write about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. we will do it. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye, guys. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Good luck. Thank you.